spot assignment, we're going to see just what's behind the making of movies. The director and the crew are shooting a documentary film. Let's take a closer look. Bob, uh, this word documentary, uh, what would you say is the difference between a documentary film and a, a feature movie? Well, there are a good many differences. One would be length. Generally speaking, documentaries are a good deal shorter than feature films. Also, uh, documentaries have something to say in the way of a message. They are informational films. Also, another term that's used interchangeably with documentary is the word actuality, actuality films. Bob, is this the thing you uh, hold up in front of the camera before each scene? This is a clapperboard, yes. This uh, identifies on the visual camera uh, the scene number and the take number, and also, as you heard, on the soundtrack. The editor back at the studio puts the two pieces of film together, matches where the lips of the clapper come together, and there you are in sync. Before the break, you were mentioning the media putting forth the information that the power elite want. I'm not sure if I understand how does the power elite do this, and why do, why do we stand for it? Why does it work so well? Okay, well, I think here we have to, I mean, there, there are really two questions here. One is this picture of the media true? And there you have to look at the evidence. I mean, I've given one example, and that shouldn't convince anybody. Uh, one has to look at a lot of evidence to see whether this is true. I think anyone who investigates it will find out uh, that the evidence to support it is simply overwhelming. In fact, it's probably one of the best supported conclusions in the social sciences. But the other question is, how does it work? I'm the, uh, I'm the media guy. Media. What'd you like? I got you an International Herald Tribune. Do you want that? anything in a Western language? Which doesn't mean <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah. Financial, Financial Times? Times, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only paper that tells the truth. <laughs> Did you get the one now uh, where they've been debating back and forth? Yes. Uh, NRC Hundle's Blood. Hundle's Blood. Okay, that's good. Well, this evening's uh, program is scheduled as a debate, which puzzled me all the way through. Uh, there are some problems. One problem is that no proposition has been set forth. As I understand debate, people are supposed to advocate something and oppose something. Uh, rather more sensibly, a topic has been proposed for discussion. Uh, the topic is manufacture of consent. It's somewhat unusual for a member of the government to debate with a professor in public. Uh, it hasn't happened in Holland before. I don't think it oft often happens elsewhere. Mr. Bogestein, the floor is yours. Now, we all know that the theory can never be established merely by examples. It can only be established by, some, by showing some internal inherent logic. Professor Chomsky has not done so. Professor Chomsky? He's quite right when he says you can't just pick examples. You have to do them in a rational way. That's why we compared examples. The truth is that things are not as simple as Professor Chomsky maintains. Another of Professor Chomsky's case studies concerns the treatment that Cambodia has received in the Western press. Here he goes badly off the rails. <laughs> we didn't discuss Cambodia. We compared Cambodia with East Timor, two very closely paired examples. And we gave approximately 300 pages of detail covering this uh, in Political Economy of Human Rights, including a reference to every article we could discover about Cambodia. Many Western intellectuals do not like to face the facts and balk at the conclusions that any untutored person would draw. Many people are very irritated by the fact that we exposed the extraordinary deceit over Cambodia and paired it with the simultaneous suppression of the U.S. supported ongoing atrocities in Timor. That, people don't like that. Uh, for one thing, we were challenging the right to lie in defense of the state. For another thing, we were exposing the, act the apologetics and support for actual ongoing atrocities. That doesn't make you popular. Where did he learn about the atrocities in East Timor or in Central America, if not in the same free press which he so derides? You can find out where I learned about them by looking at my footnotes. I learned about them from human rights reports, from church reports, from refugee studies, and extensively from the Australian press. 
Uh, there was nothing from the American press because it was silenced. Chairman, this is an attempt at intellectual intimidation. These are the ways of the bully. Professor Chomsky uses the oldest debating trick on record. He erects a man of straw and proceeds to hack away at him. <laughs> Professor Chomsky calls this the manufacture of consent. I call it the creation of consensus. In Holland we call it draagvlak, which means foundation. Professor Chomsky thinks it is deceitful, but it is not. In a representative democracy, it means winning people for one's point of view. But I do not think that Professor Chomsky believes in representative democracy. I think he believes in direct democracy. With Rosa Luxemburg, he longs for the creative, spontaneous, self-correcting force of mass action. That is the vision of the anarchists. It is also a boy's dream. Uh, those who believe in democracy and freedom uh, have a serious task ahead of them. What they should be doing, in my view, is dedicating their efforts to helping the despised common people to struggle for their rights and to realize the democratic goals that constantly surface throughout history. Uh, they should be serving not power and privilege, but rather their victims. Freedom and democracy are by now not merely values to be treasured, they are quite possibly the prerequisite to survival. It's a conspiracy theory, pure and simple. It is not borne out by the facts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have to go yes. to Amsterdam. If you'll excuse me, I'm leaving. <laughs>41 minutes I've been whining about how the elite and how the government have been using thought control to keep radicals like yourself out of uh, the public limelight. Now, uh, you're here. I don't see any CIA men waiting to drag you off. You were in the paper. They, that's where everyone here heard you were coming from, in the paper, and I'm sure they're going to publish your comments in the paper. Now, a lot of countries, you would have been shot for what you have done today. So what are you whining about? This is, we are allowing you to speak and I don't Fine. see any thought control. First of all, I haven't been saying, I haven't said one word about my, keep, my being kept out of the limelight. The way it works here is quite different. Now, I don't think you heard what I was saying, but the way it works here is that there is a system of shaping, uh, control, and so on, which gives a certain perception of the world. I gave one example. I'll give you sources where you can find thousands of others. That's, and it has nothing to do with me. 
It has to do with marginalizing the public and ensuring that they don't get in the way of elites who are supposed to run things without interference. In a review of the Chomsky Reader, it was written that as he's been forced to the margins, he's become strident and rigid. Do you feel this categorization of your later writings is accurate and that you've been a victim of this sort of process you've been describing? Well, the business about being forced to the... Uh, other people will have to judge about the stridency. I won't talk... I don't believe it, but anyway, that's for other people to judge. However, the matter of being forced to the margins is a matter of fact, and the fact is the opposite of what is claimed. Uh, the fact is it's much easier to gain access to even the major media now than it was 20 years ago. You've dealt in such unpopular truths and have been such a lonely figure as a consequence of that. Do you ever regret either that you took the stand you took, writ have written the things you have written, or that they, we had listened to you earlier? Uh, I don't. I mean, there are particular things which I would do differently because you think about things, you do them differently. But in general, I would say I do not regret it. I mean, do you like being closed. controversial? No, so no, it's a nuisance. Because this mass medium pays little attention to the views of dissenters, not just Noam right. Chomsky, but, but, but most dissenters do not get much of a hearing in this medium. No, in fact, that's, again, completely understandable. They wouldn't be performing their societal function if they allowed favored truths to be challenged. <laughs> Now, notice that that's not true when I cross the border anywhere, so that I have easy access to the media in just about every other country in the world. There's a number of reasons for that, and one reason is I'm primarily talking about the United States, and it's much less threatening. Your view there is that the military, militarization of the American economy essentially has come about because there are not other means of controlling a, the American population. In a democratic society. I mean, it may be paradoxical, but the freer the society is, the more it's necessary to resort to uh, devices like uh, induced fear. Okay, I'll go along with that. Arguably, he is the most important intellectual alive today. And if my program can give him 500,000 people listening or three quarters of a million people listening, I'll be delighted. Okay, Professor, in your own time. Wartime planners understood that actual war aims should not be revealed. They uh, part of the reason why the media in Canada and in Belgium and so on are more open is that it just doesn't matter that much what people think. It matters very much what the politically articulate sectors of the population, those narrow minorities, think and do in the United States because of its overwhelming dominance on the world scene. But of course that's also a reason for wanting to work here. We might call the fifth freedom, the freedom to rob, exploit, and dominate, and to curb mischief by any feasible means. Let's conclude, not include. The United States is ideologically narrower in general than other countries. Furthermore, the structure of the American media is such as to pretty much eliminate critical discussion. Our guests are as far apart on the Contra question as American intellectuals can be. Now, if we had the slightest concern with democracy, which we do not in our foreign affairs and never have, we would turn to countries where we have influence, like El Salvador. Now, in El Salvador, they don't call the uh, archbishop bad names. What they do is murder him. They do not, uh, repre they do not censor the press. They wipe the press out. They sent the army in to blow up the church radio station. The editor of the independent newspaper was found in a ditch, mutilated, and, and cut to pieces with don't, machete. Don't, don't May I continue? I did well, not interrupt you. Don't you ever want to put they, a time value they, on anything you say? Excuse, you want that to was lie, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm, talking about I'm talking about 1980. You are a I'm systematic, systematic liar. Did these that, things happen or didn't they? Th these things did not happen in the context in which you suggest really? at all. I, I, we, you we, are a phony, mister, and it's time that yeah. the people well, read you crank correctly. Uh, it's, it's, clear, it's clear why you want to divert me from the discussion that no, I... No, it's not. Yeah, it's no, because but let you me, get tired of rubbish. Uh, uh, but let's continue given, with... No, uh, ex sorry. Except we can't. I'm afraid we're out of time. We thank you both, John Silver and Noam Chomsky. <laughs>